Hi everybody and welcome to Dublin Tech Talks uh, in association with Icon Accounting. Uh, we continue our product talks. Um, today On today's show we have Glenn Holmes, who's Senior Project Manager in Workday. Uh, we'll be talking about what product means to Glenn, how he got into it, um, where he sees the future within product and, and, and best practices within a product environment. Um, hope you enjoy. Hi Glenn and welcome to Dublin Tech Talks. Hi Leon, Gavin, how are you? Uh, it's great to see you again. Um, yeah, you too. Do you want to kick off the show by giving people a bit of a background about who you are, where you've come from, what do you do? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so um, that's Glenn Holmes, my name. I am uh, uh, work in product management in Workday, so I'm sure uh, a lot of people, uh, particularly in the Dublin area, in Dublin Tech Talks, so would be aware of Workday. We're, uh, for those who aren't, we're a HR, finance, planning student learning software company in the cloud we're based out of um just outside of uh, the bay area so in a place called pleasanton in um california and we've our european or EMEA headquarters in smithfield in dublin and a nice building there beside the distillery and obviously we're not in there at the moment and uh yeah i've been working there for about uh four and a half years now um i work in um the integrations area so i'm a product manager for uh, tooling for integration so building integrations between workday and third party systems so it's kind of a it's kind of a mix of technical and 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 um about uh, product management uh prior to that i worked in um i worked in sales methodology software a company called taz which turned to alta 5 which is now upland and i worked previously that in life insurance software um, and reinsurance. I've worked in CRM software and in a previous life I was actually a developer. So I developed, um, I was a contractor and kind of ran my own teams and had um, a long contract with various financial um, institutions in, 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 in Dublin. Um, kind of ended with a great financial crash which I say none of my systems were <laughs> responsible for not directly responsible for Gavin I, I hope but um yeah so kind of I've been working in product management probably since around that time so I was probably like like most product managers Gavin I was probably doing product management before I realized I was I was a product manager or that was what it was called um and doing it very 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 um kind of haphazardly um and it's been great over the last I think 10, uh, 12 years since I've been a product manager, that the discipline has become it's become more disciplined and um, yeah. practice of product management. So 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 that that's a good thing. So yeah, kind of um probably a standard enough career in product management, but um, but I've I've been exposed to a few different types of industries, I suppose, which is different types of product management functions, which has been um, interesting. Yeah, no, the more I talk to people in senior product roles or, or people as they come through, they the, the journey seems to nearly dictate where you know where, where you end up and then, like it's it's a it, there's nobody comes out of college well they might now i know there's one mm -hmm. or two courses but saying you know what i'm going to be a product manager um and, and it seems to be the the learnings along the way that really sets the kind of thought process into what product what good product looks like or, or, or what a good product manager is going to be yeah yeah and that's interesting because um there are uh, courses you know and, and i've guest lectured on the on the product management um the heart diploma in product management the postgraduate diploma that's from in in no, well, it used to be DIT, it's TUD now. Um I went to DIT, I call it a university now as well. So yeah, great. yeah, yeah. So um yeah, I, and and that's fantastic, it's a fantastic course, and it's great to see. It's one of the few in the world. You know, um, particularly when I talk to my American colleagues, they're always very interested. I'm like, oh, God, you've got that over over in Dublin. Um, so, yeah, it's it's what what they call the accidental profession. I think someone coined it, um, product management. It's like most people fall into it. It's, it wasn't the kind of like, you know, I want to grow up to be a product manager. But um, but that's changing more. I see more and more um, kind of graduates being interested in the role and 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 um, which is which is a great thing, but I suppose I think mean, traditionally it was always one of those roles that um, you know you had to have the battle scars, you yeah. know you had to kind of you've had to have made all the mistakes to understand and and to an extent I think yes if you're at a senior level in product management that that's that still carries you know but 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 it definitely like I mean even in in, in work that we have a lot of associate product management roles where we graduates come in and you know a lot of them are very successful and um, product managers product owners so. Um, 
you know, probably for a long time, the, the, the kind of product management itself didn't do a good job of, 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 of probably product managing it, the, the, yeah. it, it, it itself, so product management, product management, if you know what I mean. So we weren't good at communicating, like, I suppose, value what it is. It seemed to be a dark art, uh, unless you were in an organization that really had a product management function or emphasis. So um, that's changing now, thankfully, you know. Yeah, it, it's something that I saw evolve probably back in 15 when people started talking about products and, and start suddenly people who are project managers became product managers. Mm-hmm. And if you had asked them what they were doing, they were saying, yeah, I work in a product house now. So I'm, you know, a product manager, but mm-hmm. you know, it, it has over the last couple of years really solidified into, you know, a senior, very important role for businesses that are focused on delivering customer centric products. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you look for in a, in a product manager or in a, you know, when building a team and you want to get a good product manager into, into the team, you know, is there a certain criteria you think about in your mind? Is it a, a mindset? Is it a skill set? What, what type of way is it? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Like, and you know, and there's, there's always kind of stock answers for these, right? There's always kind of like, you, you know, don't you like have, stock answers. Yeah. You, know, you have to have like, you know, uh, curiosity and um, you have that, but I mean, I would say, if you're going to hire anybody in any role, they should have a curiosity, right? So I don't think don't think to be product management um, specific. Um, I think I think one of one of the one of the the, the real um, I suppose difficulties I see with people transitioning, particularly maybe from a tech de- development role into product management, or or you know maybe even a project role. Um, or I mean, I think I think generally with human nature is that we. We're very solution focused uh, as 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 a species, right? And that's great because it's probably why we're here today is that we kind of figure out things and and we listen to reply though mainly we don't listen to understand. So if anybody's read, you know, famous book is um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's the systems one thinking and systems two thinking, and we're very very good at the I think systems one thinking. So we're very good at, at responding. And if you and replying and coming up with solution. And if you've been a developer and engineer, your focus is always with solution, solution. And I think we, there's a severe lack of kind of that first principle thinking of actually going and understanding the problem space. And, and this is an answer when everyone gives you understand the problem, understand the problem, understand the problem. But it, but everyone will say this, you know, that, you know, that's what you, that's what you really need. But I probably still see a lack of, or not lack, certainly a, 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 a a tendency to, to for us all and it's just again human nature to veer towards coming up with solutions as opposed to really really defining the the, the, the problem space and understanding um exactly what you're trying to solve and i think that's that's the fundamental thing i mean most of the other things like you know you've got to be a good communicator you've got to be be you know um you know people talk about empathy people talk about um you know like i would say like you know you've got to understand biases there's certain there's like it's kind of like social anthropology that's what product management really is, you know, and it is, it's understanding kind of your uh, customer's anxieties, you know, the mark demands and, um, you know, where value can be delivered. I, I kind of say we're the architects of competitive advantage. That's kind of my definition of, of a product manager. You know, that's what we really need to do. And that competitive advantage manifests and just delivering ultimate value to people. But ultimate value is solving the right problems. Yeah. And that's, you know, and, and that's, again, that's you know read any product manager blog tell you about problem definition problem definition but i still think we're, we're what that really means is is is, is more gray you know I, I think that's an i i that's a saying i've heard for the last few years the, the problem i always ask that question when i'm talking to businesses starting starting up or you know if i'm talking to founders you know what problem are you were you were you solving and how did that come about but that that you know we were never okay i'm gonna blanket statement we were never really taught like that as in school or in education no. to think of the problem um, and we're always apart from maths and solve solve for x and show me your show me your solution yeah. we never it was never ingrained into us that there's a problem to solve go solve it to come back with your understanding but what even, even, mathem- even mathematics right solve for x why why do we solve not i mean solve for x or y but why uh why, why, why are we solving for X, right? And I'm not, you're not going to ask that leaving certain maths, right? You're probably not going to do well if you if you handed back your exam paper going, you know, I understand. I found why. Solve, <laughs> solve uh, this theorem, but really, why do you want me to, you know? But, but, but that's the, that's the thing. Um, 
you know, um, we get we 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 tend like one of the one of, I I so as I kind of moonlight as a well, I kind of I do moonlight as a as a as a lecturer. So I lecture in National College of Ireland in in um, the Higher Diploma in Data Analytics, and my module is, is um, very much like a product management module. It's business analysis and communications, and one of the one of the the part of one of the kind of core competencies we look at um to be to you know to understand problems is communication and i always ask one of the questions i ask in the module uh, I mean, any students now they'll get the right answer any future students but i ask them kind of what ways the did you communicate today okay and they'll tell me like you know all the mediums like whatsapps they text they talked they you know had a phone conversation and very very few people ever say i listened mm. You know, they don't, it's just not rated as a part of communication. I, I listened today. And that's kind of um, that's kind of where we're, we're, where our problems, I think, lie. Um, I do an active le- listening um, challenge with the, with the students and I give them I give them an extract from a newspaper and it's 152 words. It takes less than 60 seconds to read it. It's just a small extract. Mm. And I ask for questions on it and no one ever gets a question right. <laughs> Because it's 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 just it's an exercise in bias. It's an exercise in 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 you know how we frame things and how we you know basically our bias. And and I think that that kind of manifests itself. And when we're trying to solve problems, we no matter what we we see thing we see we come up with a solution very quickly. And even if we try to park that to the side, if we think it's good, we'll we'll always try to. So we talk about hypothesis in um, in 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 product management. You know, forming a hypothesis and experimenting and trying and, and really good product companies do that and do that really well. But a lot of product, product, product and like I mean, I, I have a I have biases too. We all do. We all have yeah. unconscious and conscious biases, right? Um, and it's very hard to eradicate them. Um, so ultimately, I think you know we need to we need to listen a little bit more. We need to t- step back and not jump into making decisions and solutions. We need to let the data, let the research kind of tell us the direction where we're going um i think that's 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 really ultimately where we need to get it from 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 that kind of perspective on you know again un- uncovering the problem through listening yeah and it's there's two things there i'll pick up on one is the the, the listening the active listening it's it's mm-hmm. until you're shown what active listening is you, you don't understand it so i did a, a one of the imi courses the leadership course in the imi and there's a whole half day spent on active listening and i remember seeing it going why, why would you have an active listening half day like we, we all listen and it's it's probably the biggest downflow we all have we all have our point that we want to get across so mm-hmm. glenn yeah whatever you've said for 10 minutes but i'm going to tell you this yeah. and you're like no well, you haven't listened to anything i've said yeah. So yes, like that is such a big problem and a leadership level, especially where you go in with even your bias or your predetermined outcomes, mm-hmm. you know, you want to get your point across because you've been thinking about this point, irrespective of what you've told me, I'm going to tell you this point. And I just thought that was one of the, it, you know, it was one of those kind of drop moments in my mind. Oh, I do that all the time. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm ready to tell you how I feel, even though that's not what we're talking about. So oh, yes. 100%. So I think companies need to, you know, if we're talking about how to make people better, it's active listening all the way in my mind. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is. It, it, and I've seen very few kind of, and I, all the organizations have been in very few kind of even internal training courses or activities on really training people to actively listen. Um, it's interesting, actually. It's a good point, like, you know, because it is, it is. And it's something that I, I see with my students, it becomes a real kind of, you know, eureka moment. You might yes. say because you can see that kind of in them and kind of go, oh yeah, okay. And it's kind of there's almost an embarrassment yeah. of how bad they were at, at listening to something so simple. Um, but um, I'm more like I, I'm I'm exactly the same as the next person. It's not I'm some active listening genius or anything like that. And um, but I you, you do try to get better. You know, you you can get better by being aware, say, of of, of, what, of your biases. You know, it was just simple techniques I picked up about like being in the room rather than being it sorry listening to the room and being involved rather than just being in the room and mm. um, that type of stuff i just didn't like i'm a f- devil for a bit on my phone like i really am and you know leaving that outside the room and kind of turning off your laptop in meetings that kind of stuff where you're actually involved and not just passive 
that type of stuff, simple things you can do uh, yeah. and asking a question and actually listening to what they're saying and not going, you have four minutes of my time, actually you have 30 seconds and then I'm gone. Things like that were, were massive changes. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, techniques around like, you know, how to, you know, be, be more in the present and stuff like that. But even, even when we're in the present, even when we, our phones aside and we're sitting there and we're giving our full attention to somebody else, if somebody is, 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 is making a statement or, you know, opining on, on something, the minute you hear something generally that you disagree with, that's what's in your mind. That's what you want to reply to that statement. And it doesn't matter what the next five minutes or four minutes of discourse is or, or monologue is. That's what you're going to focus on. And that's not that's the problem with that's not actively listening. And um, like there's techniques of, you know, you, you've probably done the IMI course where, you know, if there's something somebody says you might disagree with, you write it down quickly and you continue giving people your attention and you come back to that at the end. And sometimes what you found is that the thing you've, you've originally written and disagreed, somebody has kind of either convinced you subsequently that actually it's right in, in the rest of their, of their um, monologue or whatever it was, um, or in the rest of the discourse you've been, you've been convinced, or else um, you know, they've, they've explained it well, or you know, they've kind of clarified what, they're, what, they're, what, they, what they mean by it. So that's what I mean by you, you give people the time to to finish and you actively listen to the entire mm. um you know as a discourse than rather than just focusing on that thing because we do it like the minute somebody says something you disagree with like oh, that, that's wrong that's wrong no you know you're kind of you're itching to kind of I, I blame twitter for that. that that's what i blame yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well well we, i think humans were around before twitter so uh, <laughs> maybe not the twitter one, is just one the, line arguments weren't yeah, yeah. <laughs> um the other thing, data led is, is I wrote down because I was already ahead of you. Uh, data led product design. Um, it's it's not something new, but it's something I'm hearing a lot more of. Where mm -hmm. product owner, product head of products, senior products are saying, you know, we need better data. We need data led decisions. Mm -hmm. Is that more common now, or is it just something that has been always there but people are talking about it um you see i think it's, it's a good question right because people are like it's really popular and everyone should be doing it and was it always there i think really i know from like the time when i started product management you know product management really if you think about it, it's about research right and and like <laughs> I love the way, like we call it, you know, hypothesis, and we talk. And like, if you're an actual researcher and scientist, you would laugh at product management because we don't do. We're not rigorous, like, you know, no matter how much data we use and, and use the hypothesis, like, you know, scientists would like be shaking their heads, going, "Oh my god, you have no idea when you talk about hypothesis." And stuff. But anyway, but I, I'll digress slightly. But but um, you know, you would have always used if you're doing any research, proper product management, you use data. You use data either to inform decisions. You use data to back up maybe some like a, a hypothesis that you have so when it's not it's not in it shouldn't be a new thing but i think with the rise of product management it's become so relevant right because previously what you had is you had founder ceos you had maybe senior people in the organization and they thought they were representative of their market so they come in with an opinion and it was opinion-based products so it was like i know that the market wants you know an analytics product but that's what we're building and you know you go well you're the you're the boss yeah let's build it and i think um with the with the rise or kind of the importance or you know the the emphasis on product management approaches now product management is brought in they say well like you know where's where's the evidence behind this okay so we need to be you know we need to have the data be you know available in order to make um the right decisions and to be able to deliver value and to understand that we're doing the right thing um I think where we've gone though, we 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 we've 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 probably and it's become so simple. We've become like you know very 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 data driven. Yeah, and that's really good. Data is excellent. But like when you say data, it, there's been a massive massive move towards the quantitative side of, of data. So data is more than just you know what the machines spit out. Okay, so there's massive amounts of quantitative data. And I got a great quote I remember a couple of years ago, and it's by um um. I was actually doing a talk with the, the he owns um I can't what's his name an Italian guy he's uh, he owns balsamic so you know balsamic the wireframing and uh, he's a he's a character and he said you can't have a conversation with data you know and I thought that that's that, that's a really good quote and he says you need to have qualitative um 
conversations you need to be able to to you know understand because you, you do get customers anxieties you do understand their needs more from discussions so the data is fantastic for informing you and getting patterns it's great for looking at you know um you know what we should always have is for every product you know have your success metrics right mm. like you know how do we evaluate that what we've done our product or feature or whatever done and um, is successful and data is brilliant obviously for you know it's very much tells you you know outcome driven of you know yes we have this adoption yes we have this engagement no we don't here are some problems here's some usage here's what people are using here's what people aren't so we've got a lot of analytics around that but i think we need to be very careful of going too far in the qualitative approach and we need to augment our qualitative um data research with our quantitative um data because that is data too right mm. Um, and how you do it if it's if it's like you know you do your surveys if you do your workshops if you whatever whatever way you, you kind of obtain that quantitative data you or qualitative data i should say you should um you should augment that with your quants so um it's not it's not it's not a new thing to, to answer question like you know it's just it's just become more emphasized over the last number of years and, and you know data data can be hard to get as well like particularly uh, good like qualitative data you know it can be hard to get um, and would that come back to companies not wanting to listen to what their customers say in essence or are they is it you know that's great that's a you know it takes too much of a of a pool to get a an unbiased understanding of what your what the product is doing or is it just easier to download drop rates or download spend where like button rates and stuff Listen, let's 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 it depends right on the kind of type of organization you are as well, right? If you're if you're like you know, workday or an Amazon and you've got millions and millions of customers, that level of quantitative data is is just fantastically valuable. Right? You're getting all sorts of insights into that. And obviously doing qualitative research is takes time, right? So you gotta interview lots of people, you gotta talk, that takes time. Whereas I can get a dashboard up and I can see all sorts of patterns from it. That's brilliant. So that's that's one thing. That's kind of where people go, well, you know, I can talk, go out and spend some time doing my research and what I prefer my, like my product managers. I want my product managers to be writing requirements and running the team. You know, that's that's one part of product management. It's not uh, all parts of product management. Um, so you kind of have that. And then you kind of come to the other end. Is that like, you know, we listen to customers. A lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of companies don't listen to customers because we listen to customers, but that in itself is not always the, the when I say listen to customers, um, it's like you know, being driven by customer or yeah. very small sample size of customers. Um, that's obviously a very dangerous thing. So we've got to listen to the market and not just listen to customers, you know. Um, so um I, I I don't think I think I think a lot of a lot of traditional and and, and I, I I definitely we're moving away from this has been kind of you know, we, the representative heuristic. It's it's that people in senior positions think that they represent people who use their software they understand the problems you know and we talk about empathy they, they think they've empathy or they, they they like to think they've empathy with people and then they go so we're building this and you know product management is obviously the antithesis of that right that's that's where it's coming in but yet lots of product organizations and i i, I know for example i know i've talked to some product managers who say i'm still working in an environment like that i'm, yeah. I'm a product manager we've product management but that's right and they you know they hate it and they don't want to do it but you know they, they eventually move on to, to work in better places but um but i think um i think i think like yeah it depends like i mean if you've got lots of data you will use data but there's there's a there's a there's a great uh, phrase i've read recently i can't remember i can't recall it, it says uh, like you know product managers use data like a drunk uses a lamppost to lean on rather than for illumination <laughs> you know and i think that 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 that's quite good you know because yeah. it's like oh i've got i've got all the data the data you know i've got yeah. all this data and so i don't need to do anything you know don't need to talk. Don't need to kind of validate it. I don't need to, you know. I just I've got it. It's, it's telling me patterns. Let's do it. So, um, it's interesting. You know, it, it's a balance, like everything. Really, and, you know. And is is that the kind of evolution you've you've seen, um, say over the last few years, where good product managers or good product environments don't just sit on the data. They 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 listen. Like they they don't become. And I will probably get shot by saying this. Like de facto project managers for teams where they can put their hands up and say, that's only a third of my job. The other two thirds of the job is as important or if not more. Is that, is that kind of, have you seen that more? Or is that just kind of- um, Do you mean like, um, 
do you mean like you know good product managers don't just rely on that and they do get out and do the other stuff yeah that it, yeah yeah I, i've i would have to probably say no and what i mean by that is that i think more and more we're leaning towards it data will data them because it, it tends to be a very it's a really interesting data-driven product management and there's lots of kind of big players behind this data-driven product management and you know they'll emphasize and blog and talk about you know you've got to you've got to be so everything's got to be data driven and they're not I, i'm not saying they're wrong they're actually entirely mm-hmm. correct and the first thing i would ask are where's the data where's the data but it's not the only like data coming from an analytics platform is not the only data you need to make your decisions right and um, and like what happens in a lot of cases we don't like if, if we're being realistic as product management well a lot of times we don't have data even if we've got lots of reams of data coming from machines and lots of platform and lots of you know I- information on user engagement and adoption a lot of times when we're trying to innovate or come something you know again it's that you know we use the data to lean on rather than illuminate yeah because it, it'll kind of tell you and we pick it and our bias will go well that piece of data fits my kind of argument yeah. but what you need to do a lot of time you need to you need to go out and actually do proper field research in order to understand um those um those problems so or validate them and, and uh, for for sure so i mean data allows you i mean the data is brilliant and allows you to have those conversations like you can see patterns and you can go to your customers and go like i'm, I'm seeing this trend you know let's explore a little bit more and that's yeah. fantastic um but i think that um i think that's a lot of people have, have kind of maybe moved towards a lot of their job being doing queries and looking at analytics as opposed to the other side of product management which is getting out and you know talking and with your with your market and engaging with your stakeholders and understanding kind of those anxieties and nuances you know yeah and that's i always anybody who talks to me about anything it's always that way i love when if somebody's trying to sell me something and they say, I see you do X, Y, and Z, this can fit what you've been doing. To me, that's just like, oh, perfect. I don't have to explain what I've been doing on your website for the last three hours. You know, you've come to me yeah. and said, this is the actual solution that you need for your problem. I go, oh, thank God. Yeah. So, yeah no, that, that will always be my positive on that. Yeah. Yeah. You do need, I mean, uh, people do like that, but I mean, again, I, I'd go back to it. It's hard when you've got lots of customers and, and a big market, but the, like a, a great, in a very interesting um kind of case study is um like red bull so um if you think of like years ago like coke was always the dominant soft drink mm. right always the dominant soft drink so coca-cola so if you were a product manager going to kind of um going out there to you know challenge coca-cola in the market right you've got this drink that's dominated you know, what would be the, the factors you would look at? Like, and you look at the data, you look at, well, like, you know, if I look at the data, people buy it, you know, the demographics and all this. And, you know, so I'm going to challenge them maybe on price. I'm going to challenge them maybe on volume. I'm going to give somebody more, you know, value. Mm-hmm. I'm going to challenge it maybe on taste, right? That would be one thing that makes up tastier. And, you know, and, you know, probably reams of data, you know, in, in the market to tell you all of these things about, you know, the demographics and who it is and, and taste tests. And, um, and Red Bull came along and made a drink that is way more expensive uh generally comes in half the size 250 milliliter cans as opposed to 330 and in every single taste test right absolutely got annihilated it was the worst product they ever did sent out in a taste test right so they sent it to the market people came back saying uh, excuse my friend saying it, it tastes like piss like that was the that was one of the yeah. quotes like, it was hated and it's the most successful soft drink in the world now. And there's always outliers, but one of the things that they, again, to go back, they went out, if you look, there's, there's case studies on HBR and all about and Harvard, uh, there's a view about this. And um, they went out and they fundamentally understood the anxieties of the market that they were trying to serve. And it was, you know, I don't drink it because I'm thirsty. I drink it because one, the energy thing, like, I want to be, you know, I want to, I want to kick, you know, because mm-hmm. people are drinking Coke because it's sugar content. You know, it's giving them a buzz. So they're like, oh, well, actually, you know, we give you a bit of the pep, a bit of energy. Um, they were drinking it because they wanted it being associated with a brand, this exclusivity. So yeah. the whole Formula One thing, the whole extreme sports, this kind of association. Coke was this kind of bland thing that everybody kind of, you know, anybody in the world, the Red Bull. So they, they, they kind of, they, and, you know, if you read the articles, I'm doing better explanation than I. But it, they looked at those kind of real underlying anxieties or needs of, of, of people at once. And even if they were insecure needs, they were needs and anxieties. Yeah. And that's what they targeted. And the data would have never told them. The data would have told them, stay away from this. So yeah. 
I suppose like, and that's not, and like there's, there's many more, there's many more um, examples of where data was really good, right? And I'm not yeah. saying it is excellent, but I suppose the thing is that if you want to build a really, a really good product, maybe, you know, you've got to use the data. If you want to probably build a, a, a disruptor or change, you probably got to, you know, go against the grain slightly, yeah. you know, but you've got to do that in, in any, to be successful in anything. I think you need, you know, lots, I think you definitely need to engage with your, your market. You know, you yeah, need- I'll, I'll, I won't take much of your time, but you just ping something in my brain there. The disruptor side of things, is, is that what, you know, is that why products are actually getting the good ones that we know of, the brands that we all use in our digital wallets now, or we're mm. more used to, you know, quick, purchases using single sign-on stuff like that it, mm. they've listened to what the disruptor needed to be and have just played on that similar to red bull on that kind of being associated with a brand does that you know that seems to be yeah. more apparent in my, for me and my own buying patterns yeah yeah it is i'm like you know again there's always lovely stories that, that emphasize this and what you don't hear is all the times this was a disaster like you know and yeah. people didn't disrupt and and you know but I think one of the one of the um, the the key things, like if you go to like single tapping your like you know if you said like you know even five ten years ago you know you're gonna be able to use your phone as your bank card and tap mm-hmm. people would have been like no way you know there's there's inherent like you know I need to have this physical thing because a bank card and money and anyone could take your phone right and just go around spending your money on their phone so there's all you know so changing that psyche and understanding but but. So if you just went on that and, did, you know, you did a bit of, you know, even if you did a bit of uh, uh, qualitative research, you probably would have come back with, you know, it's probably not much of a gore. Um, you know, and that's why, like, you know, that's why, you know, even in fintech, like, there's always these traditional ways of thinking, like, lar- and we talk about large organizations like banks and, you know, they're not very innovative. And, you know, why did they not come up with an idea like, like Revolut? And it's like, it's not that they didn't come up with an idea. It's just culturally, yeah. they weren't prepared to, you know, disrupt, literally disrupt your own market is the hardest thing to do. Yeah. And real innovators disrupt their own market. They continuously kind of disrupt themselves. They try to put themselves out of business. That's a very hard cultural thing to do. So, um, so you know, I think and it, it's really hard thing to, t- thing to do, but I think a good product management mindset is to say, how do I actually kill my own product nearly? Yeah. You know, how, do I, how do I continue to disrupt? Or how do I, how do I kill my business model? How do I continue? And I think that that's where you, you'll really innovate. I'm not saying you have to do it. You know, you have to continue. But, but, to but, 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 but you, that way of thinking is, is, is important. If you, if you look at it the other way, there's everybody else has taken that. How can I take that yeah. market share? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Every, there's other, like I, I've said that, I think I've, I've, I've blogged about this before where, where like, you know, if you're not disrupting your product, someone else is trying to, yeah. some other product management manager is out there trying to eat into your market share. Yeah. It's trying to take a bit away. It's trying to even maybe expand the market in a way. Um, and it could be expanding the market based on your kind of dominance of it or your, you know, your market share. So if you could have almost created this market and now they're kind of, you know, feeding on that. Um, but sometimes it's, it's and it's good to build an ecosystem, don't get me, get me wrong, but it's, uh, it's also good to kind of see where you can exploit it and you can disrupt your product for sure. Yeah, I've, I've been working in an industry for nearly 15 years that's been disrupted since day one. Mm. Every, every year there's something else that's going to take over. So it's like... Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the last question I'll ask you, and it's just something that came to me there. What do you think the the next couple of years within product will be? Like, will there be a rise of, you know, a CPO type person within organizations? There is already a good yeah. stance now. Is, will product outstrip the, you know, digital transformation type comments? Is, is product going to be the new CTO in essence? Uh, I don't think it'll replace a CTO, but I definitely see a rise in 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 the kind of emphasis on product or the or the, the value of, of of a product management function. And I say, and I'm sure you know in your industry, there seems to be and definitely, and it's it's pure anecdotal from my perspective because I don't you know look at the data across the industry, but I see many more uh, um, organizations with um with CPOs or yeah. certainly product at the at the executive table. Um. I do probably still see a greater amount of companies or know of a greater amount of companies that still have your chief technology officer, chief you know, pers- uh, HR per- person officer, COO, CEO, and they probably go up to director of product, maybe, yeah. no, or head of product management. They don't. So you're not, they're not quite at that level and they still report into CTO. Um, 
I, 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 I'm, I'm hoping that changes, and that's no disrespect to CTO, but like if I was a CTO, I was like, well, you know, I'm the technology person and not the product person. And you know, I've worked with CTOs that are bringing product people, but they'd be the first to go. It'd be great if I just had a product person, you know, <laughs> doing the product stuff and, and kind of, um, and obviously it, it's very, it's so closely aligned. So, right, you know, you can't get a product built without yeah. having good engineers, right? But likewise, it's very hard to build a good product um, if you don't have a good product management function. Yeah. You know, you can kind of get away with it sometimes, but 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 uh, but you can probably never build a product without having engineers, right? Yeah. But um, but it's I think that 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 I wouldn't say delineation, but those pillars um are starting to definitely form more in organizations. And I see over the next few years definitely been a rise of the kind of product function. Um I think product management itself um is becoming more disciplined, but it's still slightly fragmented into how we do it. Like there's you, you know, you got the product manager it's in management in different companies and even like companies that look similar and same range, and it'd be doing it very, very differently. And, and I'm not saying it's a one size fit all, but there's there's very few kind of frameworks, there's very few kind of um you know, it is kind of a bit learning by doing as opposed to, okay, and that, that's why it's great that we've got product management masters and product management um, uh, diplomas and all, as I think they, they put a little bit of formality and structure to, to, to the yeah. practice of product management. Brilliant. Yeah, Glenn, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I hope everybody else found it as interesting. Yeah. Um, I've put all your contact details on, 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 the, on the, the post. Uh, thanks, Mill, for your time and really appreciate speaking with you. No, it was a pleasure, Gavin. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, hope if uh, hope something made sense. <laughs> <laughs> it was Glenn Holmes, uh, Senior Product Manager at Workday. I uh, hope you enjoyed some really interesting conversations there around uh, data, listening, empathy, um, bias. Really, really interesting, and I uh, hope you enjoy. Um, if you find this interesting and you want to hear more, please subscribe to us on YouTube or on your podcast listening areas. All right, talk to you soon. Thanks, Mel.